everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is our fourth webinar in our series, and we're really excited that you joined us. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, leveraging the intermediary space, connecting with influential organizations to expand your My name is Liz Farley Ripple, and I co-direct the Center for Research, Use, and Education. I'm joined with not only a wonderful panel, who I'll introduce shortly, uh, but my esteemed colleagues on the project, Samantha Shevchuk, Debbie Miklos, and Katie Tilley. Um, we are hosting this series in partnership with the Society for Research and Educational Effectiveness to sort of mobilize some of the lessons learned from our seven years as a knowledge utilization center funded by IES. Um, so if folks would kindly introduce themselves in the chat, say hi, use that for back channel communications. We encourage that strongly. Um, if you don't mind keeping yourself on mute when you're not talking, the panel will, of course, unmute <laughs> for uh, the uh, most of our time today. Um, but just so our dogs, kids, it's summer. I know. I know that there's a whole household uh, going on for many of you. Um, so just if you don't mind keeping yourself on mute during when you're not speaking, that would be great. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and jump into our conversation. Um, today, we're just kick off with a little bit about the Center for Research, Use, and Education. I'm going to share some data of, from, about what we've learned about the role of intermediaries. I'm just going to do a little dip, not going to be a huge um, discussion of our data or our data sources. Um, you can learn more about that from some of our reports and from our website. Um, and then we're going to spend the bulk of our time with this amazing uh, panel of experts and intermediary organizations that we've invited to join the conversation today. Um, speaking of that panel of experts, I'd just like to briefly introduce them, share some information on the screen about them, and they'll, they'll tell you a little bit more about their work and their organizations um, after I anchor our conversation data. So we're joined today by Matt Dawson from Curriculum Associates, David Barnes from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, Peter Rada from Edutopia, Tiffany Neal from the Oklahoma State Department of Education, and Lisa Thomas from the American Federation of Teachers. If you guys can give a wave, say hi, let everyone know who you are. Um, and we'll do some more introductions in, in just a little bit. So let me jump in and tell you a little bit about the Center for Research, Use, and Education. We were funded by um, the Institute for Education Sciences, one of two knowledge utilization centers. Um, <clears throat> One, the other one is the National Center for Research Policy and Practice out of uh, CU Boulder. Um, and our work, we centered our work around the idea of rethinking for schools. So we focus on how schools are using research in decision making, as well as how research is produced. And in exploring that work, we really are interested in the decision making process, influential individuals, uh, what processes look like, the factors that shape them. Um, and so we have done a number of uh, activities over the last few years, a lot of which revolve around research. So we built some instruments, we did some wonderful descriptive analyses, some of these reports are coming out over time, we've done some case studies, which we'll release later this week. Um, and as we sort of wrap up our research, we wanted to make sure that we mobilized the knowledge that we are gaining. So what are the lessons we're learning? So that's one of the reasons we're here today. This is, as I mentioned earlier, this is the fourth in a series. We kicked off the series by talking about some big, big picture findings. And we followed that session up with a conversation led by my colleague, Dr. Shevchuk, on knowledge mobilization, what we mean by knowledge mobilization, what it looks like in practice. Our last session, which was two weeks ago, focused on um, hearing from practitioners about what it means for research to be relevant and, um, <clears throat> and actionable, right? Two key criteria that came out of our work. Today, we want to focus on intermediaries um, and the role intermediaries have in linking research and practice so that we, as researchers and members of the research community, can think more about how to work together. So before I do that, I'm going to ask that we, um, I'm going to drop a little poll into our uh, session here, just to get a sense of who is here. So this is, the question is really, 
How do you think of yourself partly? Now, I have a number of categories here. I've surely missed some, so don't be afraid to say other. But go ahead and indicate how you think of yourself so we get a sense of who's in the room. And this is a fast group. Sometimes I have to sit here for a while waiting for that poll. All right, we've got about two thirds have responded. All right. It seems we stalled out. Oh, no, there we go. There's another bump. All right, we're around 80 something percent. So I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll and share the results. Looks like we've got um, some research staff, we've got higher education faculty, we have folks from educational agencies and we have folks that represent knowledge brokers, which I'm gonna bet is some of our panelists. Um, we also have a couple of folks there. So um, interested to know who you are. All right, so now that we know who's here, um, let's, let's get into the content of the session. Um, as I mentioned, we're going to anchor the conversation in some of the data from our center's work. And just as a little bit of background, we are drawing on data from a survey of more than 4,000 educators, <clears throat> uh, deep dives into some school case studies for elementary schools, and a uh, brokerage case study which backwards tracked uh, research that was used in the classroom to its original source. So what are all the things that happened to it and where were the stops along the way? Um, so that's what we're gonna draw on here. If you have other questions about our methodology and our findings, you can drop it in the chat and we'll try and get with you. All right, so when we're talking about intermediaries, how are we defining? intermediary space. So Meredith Honig in an early uh, 2000s article describes intermediaries as organizations that operate between policymakers or practitioners for that matter. Um, and those um, who are implementing to affect changes in roles and practices for both parties. Now this idea of intermediaries was comes from policy. But for us, we're really thinking about that, that space that third space between research and practice, right? And so there's a wide range of organizations and individuals that are serve in these linking roles, but they're not formally part of the research enterprise um, or the sometimes the policy enterprise. And they're not really part of the practice enterprise, right? They're not affiliated with a school or a system, right? They represent professional associations. They represent curriculum providers, right? There's a whole wide space um, that we are going to lump together under intermediaries today. So let's talk more about that. So one of the first claims we want to make based on our data is that research use is largely mediated. And this is important for sort of clarifying importance of intermediary organizations, right? So why do we say this? So when we asked folks about where they go for research-based information, and remember this is a survey of one of the 4,000 educators across the country, right? They often turn to each other. Next, once they leave their immediate school community, they turn to a wide variety of intermediary organizations. In fact, more than 4,000 um, organizations were identified in our survey, which is astounding, <laughs> right? Um, that there's that big a field. And very rarely do they go directly um, to research resources. Um, in fact, some schools don't even go directly to research resources. So almost always educators are accessing research based information through someone or through a different organization, right? Rarely act, interacting with it directly. So when we see intermediary sources um, or local sources or uh, direct research, what are we actually talking about? So this sort of breaks that down a little bit more. At left, you see the greatest frequency is associated with other teachers and principals, that local education community, right? And then we see it sort of diminishes. But if we take out those local folks, right? If we say, who outside of their immediate set of colleagues do educators reach out to? We see um, 
the how important different kinds of organizations are so professional associations and that includes with content area associations right which david represents here with nctm as well as uh labor organizations such as the american federation of teachers with which lisa represents um today. We also have curriculum uh, PD providers, program developers and publishers. We have other resources, websites, web based um, materials. So I will say I believe Edutopia is categorized in that way um, in our in our data. So we have some of these really regularly utilized sources that are, are really quite influential in how educators access and think about research based information. So the second piece claim we want to make is that it's hard to scale direct relationships between research and practice, right? Which is why everyone is going to these intermediary sources, right? So when we asked at the top uh, left here, our educators about how often they've had contact with research, it, it's almost never, um, or almost no one has had contact with researchers. We ask researchers, and a lot of them have had contact, right? And so I think this really nicely illustrates the scale problem, right? Researchers may have relationships with um, practitioners at school and district levels, but the sheer volume of people that need to be reached in the education community, right? It's really hard for researchers to cover that territory, right? And so we really need a stronger network in between research and practice to help address some of these scale challenges. And then the last claim I want to make is that the intermediary space itself is underutilized. And now I say that that is not to say that folks in the intermediary, intermediary space are not doing incredibly powerful, incredibly effective work. But we, when we think about it as a system, researchers aren't necessarily leveraging that system particularly effectively and educators aren't always doing that either i mentioned that there was four thousand organizations uh listed in our survey right that's that's a bit overwhelming so what are what evidence do we have sort of of this claim and right here i'm i'm showing you a, a map of one of our broker case studies. So it started over on the right hand side with an occupational therapist who is accessing information um, about a handwriting intervention. And then we see she had some interactions within her, the um, practice community of colleagues, other OTs, her principal. But when we start to trace how she got information, we see a wide variety of actors. We have professional associations, we have conferences, we have program developers, um, we have researchers. So there's kind of a complicated path here, right? <clears throat> we also see that the research itself takes form in a number of different products, right? So we know that this space is sort of complicated, right? So. This is just an illustration of one of several cases that we, we have unpacked. And some of the claims and data from those cases really show us that the organizations that constitute the intermediary space and that link research and practice are really diverse. They range from nonprofit to for-profit, they're professional associations, they're web-based, right? It's really complicated and a very hard space to wrap our arms around. We found that they took on a, a wide range of roles, mostly in sharing information, but of course, why we were looking at them. Um, but they also engaged in capacity building. They facilitated the use of research or research informed practices. And they also served as a linking agent. They brought researchers and practitioners together. However, in spite of those important actions, we didn't see a lot of evidence of coordinated effort. Right, so an educator might go to a different uh, intermediary for different things, or a product may be moved along from research to practice by an association, but then it's picked up by a state, and then maybe the teacher has it, or a conference was held, and there wasn't, there didn't seem to be a lot of an intentionality. It didn't seem to be by design. It almost felt serendipitous. Right. So, and then <clears throat> lastly, 
um, it was really hard to ascertain how the different intermediaries along these paths and in our various cases were using research. So when they promoted research-based practices, how did they identify those? To what extent were they using research to inform their products? And so what this means is that is that there's not a lot of coordination, right? And in this sense, it becomes underutilized. In our cases, for example, we saw a lot of diversity, right? And the diversity has advantages and disadvantages. On one hand, for every need for an evidence, piece of evidence or research informed practice, there's likely a source to go to it, which is how we end up with like 4,000 um, different intermediary organizations at play in our data. Um, on the other hand, Having so many actors means that knowledge needs are not being systematically met. In other words, the infrastructure that supports access to research is, isn't adequate, or it's at least not viewed that way. Um, so the research then take a lot of stops before it gets to practice. So if you think about a traditional model of maybe dissemination or um, intermediation, you might have a researcher sends research to an intermediary or an intermediary pulls it from research and then gives it to a practitioner. And none of our cases were like A, B, C, right? It was like A, B, D, C, F, G, H, and then Z, right? And so it's a more complicated pathway. Um, and we have little insight into uh, how to better organize or leverage the system. Now, this of course means we have this big opportunity or challenge, depending on the frame you want to put on it. And that is to find ways to collaborate with influential intermediaries, several of whom are represented um, on this call, right? And were so in our data, um, as a means of more effectively and to a greater scale, supporting the role of research and practice and vice versa. So what do I mean by that? So from our data, we can sort of brainstorm a list of ways that intermediaries can support the relationship between research and practice. And these include creating spaces for researchers, policymakers, or practitioners to actually interact. And this could be a conference, right, where they get to speak to each other and share ideas, or they work together on advisory board, or are brought together on task forces or initiatives. Other ways they link research and practices by amplifying, well, um, amplifying work, right? So um, some organizations work with researchers to publish more actionable, useful products like books or articles or blogs or other kinds of pieces, even advocacy work, um, to get the word out there and to support practices. Uh, sometimes they engage in translation, right? The development of curriculum, the development of assessments, providing professional learning um, tools and resources. Sometimes they're actually providing technical assistance and professional learning, right? So they're brought in to help educators to implement this new evidence and for practice or to understand um, research in ways that helps them improve what's going on in their classroom, school, district, and so on. And we also have this growing phenomenon of research practice partnerships where research could work with intermediaries in the same way we often encourage researchers to work with practitioners, right? There can be shared goals and outcomes. Now, all of these activities are, are somewhat directional, right? So research to practice. But by being in the middle, intermediaries also have this great ability to work in the other direction. Right, which is to help researchers understand how members or constituents or audiences or even educators more broadly, um, how research can better meet their needs or what kinds of products or outputs from the research community can be valuable. Right, So there's this bi-directional role that intermediaries can play. And all of this sort of shows up in our data. But what doesn't show up in our data right, is, is how to work with intermediaries. And so for that, we really need our esteemed panel, which I'm going to turn to right now, as soon as I stop my share here. All right. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, bring our panel here to the forefront so that we can kind of have a conversation. So I'm gonna ask the folks to turn to briefly introduce themselves and uh, say a little bit about their organization and how they think about their work in the context of linking research and practice. 
Yep. I'm having difficulty with my spotlights, but I will get it. Um, okay, I'm gonna pick on someone to go first. Lisa, would you mind going first? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me? Thumbs up quickly. Great. So um, Lisa Thomas with the American Federation of Teachers and thank you, Liz, for that um, great framing. And so as you were speaking, I was just making a quick list of the ways that we interact with researchers and research community and how we get information out um, and thinking about the various relationships that we have in terms of disseminating information from higher education, from the higher education community, um, from partners. And just to share a few, um, for example, we host a professional development institute biannually called our American Federation of Teachers Teach Academy in which we invite researchers who have um, launched a new series on a topic or if they've released a scholarly um, paper, they are invited to attend the TEACH conference and share their findings. Um, sometimes we have teachers who have engaged in action research, they too can come to teach and present their um, research or they may share information and become a partner on the AFT um, Share My Lesson platform, which you can find at aftsharemylesson.com. Um, um, another way we have our online publications, um, American Educator, AFT Teach, and those are just some of the uh, online features. As you can imagine, we are um, engaged in a number of collaborations with um, Linda Darling Hammond, Charlotte Danielson. I mean, you know, we engage with lots of different um, well known authors and, and presenters. And so, my, I straddle two worlds within the American Federation of Teachers. I work on the policy side with my colleagues in government relations and legislation and crafting legislation that basically impacts the lives of all educators as well as our support personnel. And then on the practice side, I actually write content and curricula um, that is used in implementation and support professional learning on the ground. And so I kind of have my feet in, on, on both sides of the fence. And so in that regard, it allows me to engage in partnerships and collaborations and work with organizations um, and the research community like you all, but also connect with um, entities on the for-profit and nonprofit side and, and get a sense of what's going on um, in those spheres as well. And so I don't want to take up a whole lot of airspace, but give an opportunity to hear from my other colleagues. So that's the short version. Who wants to jump in next? I'm not going to call on you. <laughs> I can go. It's, it's... I mean, in a quick. Um, so, uh, so I'm Matt. Um, I work with Curriculum Associates, um, which is a, uh, for lack of a better term, we're, we're a publisher, I guess. Um, we have a lot of different things. Um, my, my official title is Senior Director of Efficacy and Implementation Research. Um, and so the work that my team does is mostly focused on, you know, doing the research around effective implementation of, of our various things. Um, you know, do students who use our stuff do better than students who don't use our stuff? So there's that piece of it. Um, but a big, a big thing that's really kind of come up in the last couple of years is really kind of extending our data to make it available for more what we call internally thought leadership. Um, so we actually have some partnerships with external universities. Um, we're part of a, a grant actually with Northwestern. It's a Gates Foundation, Gates Foundation grant. I was in Seattle yesterday about that. Um, and, you know, we, we do a lot of work with, you know, we get requests from, from researchers, from um, professional organizations. I'm not going to name anybody, but, you know, so there's, there's lots of different um, folks that kind of contact us to, to use the data. And probably because we're big, um, we're in about, I think now we, our, our most recent year, um, we had about 11 million students um, who used our diagnostic assessment, which is an interim assessment. So it's fall, winter, spring. Um, it's a norm reference, it's criterion referenced. Um, so there's lots of information there. Um, again, like there's, there's usage around the, the supplemental stuff that we have. So there's lots of kind of different data that we have access to and, and folks reach out for us for, for those kind of things. And again, I mean, I think it's interesting because 
you know, you mentioned how it happens. A lot of it is it's relationships and it's, you know, we get a lot of dissertations like folks saying, Hey, I'm working on this and I'm using iReady data. You know, can you help me? And we, yeah, sure. Happy to help you. Cause again, from our perspective, we want you to use the data correctly. We want you to understand what you're, you know, what you're looking at and how to use it um, in a way that's, that's, that's most, um, you know, honors what the data are saying. Right. So you get good results. Um, not, and again, good results in the sense of you're saying something true, not good results in, you know, what the actual impact was, because we don't, obviously we don't control that. But um, I think that, you know, we are really trying to make our data more available, make it easier for folks to use it for, you know, looking at broader kinds of questions beyond just, you know, is it better than something else or whatever, but kind of look at, you know, how learning happens and, you know, looking longitudinally at different kinds of things. So I'll stop there. Hi, Elizabeth, I'm happy to go next. Hello, everyone. I'm Tiffany Neal. Uh, I serve as the Deputy Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction here at the Oklahoma State Department of Education. And I just want to start by saying to all of our researcher friends on the call, um, uh, believe me, your work is seen and truly appreciated, even if you don't hear it on a daily basis uh, by folks like myself uh, who consider uh, ourselves, um, you know, just uh, utilizing um, as practitioners that research all the time. Uh, at the agency, um, I, I began here around 10 years ago, and I do want to let everyone know that I started as the Director of Science and Engineering Education uh, before moving to some other leadership roles. <clears throat> Excuse me, and that will be relevant for a follow-up question. But I often get asked, what is it that you do at the State Department of Education? And that is a very difficult question to answer. It really is somewhat of a black hole unless you work at the at a state agency and know all of the the day to day duties that we um, are um, wrangled into doing, so to speak. But we do a lot of policy work. We do work um, with legislators in our state. We we also work with our congressional leaders um, uh, at the national level to inform the work that they're doing. Uh, a big part of our role is regulating um, uh, or making sure schools are following um, all legislation and uh, all required uses of funding, um, reporting that is required. But we also have a strong arm of support for our K through 12 school districts, uh, which centers around helping them implement effective practices to instruction assessment or a variety of things uh, that happen in the school. And so um, I often tell people, uh, although they might think that I, I serve as a decision maker, I really am an intermediate uh, in many ways as you are. So really my role is to influence decision makers. It is to inform policymakers. It is to help them understand when a piece of legislation is going to have uh, perhaps an unintended consequence and we need to modify that. It is to influence school district leaders uh, or classroom teachers in how they implement uh, any programs or practices that they are implementing. And so the way that we really leverage research uh, is, is in, I think, three to four key areas. One is we, we leverage research and researchers to help us conduct research on effectiveness of programs, on impact of, um, of policy. We also work with researchers to gain expertise in conducting research well. And I would say lastly, we use research to inform every aspect of our work, whether it is um, instructional um, uh, or effective uh, practices in the schools, we use research to inform that, to share that. Uh, I wrote down a couple of other things. We certainly use research to um, inform uh, programs that we may be lifting, that we have state or federal funds to do at a state level. And then we try to leverage research to tackle some of the more, more persistent and systematic problems in, in education, either through guidance to districts or new programs or uh, perhaps needed legislation. So we utilize research in a variety of ways uh, in our varied roles here at the State Department of Education. And I'll turn it over to one of my other colleagues. I'll jump in. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Barnes. I'm with the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics. Uh, I serve as the Associate Executive Director. Um, NCTM is the professional organization representing pre-K through 12 mathematics teachers and everybody else 
sort of in that endeavor. Um, so we're a member organization dedicated to more and better mathematics learning experiences for each and every student. While our predominant um, members are pre-K through 12 teachers and teacher and, and teacher leaders, school and district leaders, we also have a significant, about 20% are higher ed, um, including teacher training and research. Um, what you should know is linking research and practice has been a strategic goal in some flavor for the council for the past 20 years. Um, we continue to work on this effort, um, but it, it's still an area of high need. Um, what we do, our efforts really fall in a number of big categories. One is sort of journals. How do we have a practitioner journal for pre-K through 12? We have the premier research journal in our field, and we have a journal on um, teacher preparation, the practice of teacher preparation. What I would say in that area is that finding ways to link research and practice is always a challenge. That we've had a whole range of departments and journals and places mm -hmm. to do that. Um, and, and it's always hard to fill those, those departments. And this really talks about, I'm gonna push on value. Like how do we bring value to the research community? How do we bring value to the practitioner community? And how do we have value between those that they see value um, in each other? Um, similarly, for our conferences, we have an annual meeting and we have a research conference. And for the longest time, those have existed independently. Um, there was a time when there were research sessions at the annual meeting and I will tell you that those didn't get a, a large attendance, so they stopped them. Um, this year we're pushing on, and we're actually having an overlap day for those two events. And during that time, there's collaborative problem solving um, spearheaded by the research conference to look at problems of practice. How do we bring these communities together? And I think that's one of the biggest efforts we've had. The other piece that we've done in our research conference is actually talking about actively helping early career people understand what partnerships look like. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do that, taking people that have ex had existing partnerships and working with early career people to think about how do you do this? Um, there are lots of pressures in there. The last piece I would say is about advocacy. And a couple of things that we do are research briefs and clips. How do we translate existing collections of research into um, formats that are helpful for teachers to use and districts to use to guide their practice? Um, it's actually a pretty uh, work intensive piece to do that, um, but it's one of the areas that we know is needed. Um, lastly, and I'll throw a link in the chat, We've done some work on trying to bring practitioners and researchers together. And the last time was about 2008, but there's a report about linking research and practice and how this informs a research agenda. So that's out there, um, but it continues to be ongoing work for the council. I'll stop there. Hi everyone, I'm Yuki Tirada and I'm Edutopia's research editor. And Edutopia is a, an educational nonprofit. Um, we're part of the George Lucas Educational Foundation. And uh, I primarily uh, describe us as a media organization. So we're a website, we produce uh, videos. We go film at schools quite, quite often. We look for strategies that are effective in schools and um, we will film them so that teachers can have a, a classroom view of what's working in education. Um, and as the research editor, I produce a lot of content. For Edutopia, but also have kind of a bird's eye view for Edutopia because quite a lot of our traffic comes from Google. Um, so everything that's new, um, everything everything that's new and everything that's old needs to be research aligned. So like five, six years ago, I remember we did a whole audit of all of our content looking at learning styles and making sure that the idea of learning styles um, aligns to the current research, which is that it's a myth. You don't necessarily have there's no efficacy to matching instruction 
to a perceived learning style. So one of my one of my jobs is to make sure that Edtopia as a whole is aligned with research. So I'm kind of an intermediary within the intermediary uh, organization. Uh, my background is actually in research. I was a researcher. I started off as a researcher at Edgetopia, um, vetting schools for for the Schools at Work uh, project. And part of my job, um, everything that you see on Edgetopia is pitched by a teacher or a writer or, or a, someone on our staff. Um, and part of my job is to kind of bring that researcher voice to the pitch meeting to make sure that everything that we see and everything we produce um, is aligned to research and we're not promoting anything uh, that can hurt students or that doesn't, al uh, doesn't align with current research. Um, so, yeah. I think, Yuki, that was the fascinating to think about the intermediary within the intermediary, right? And um, I, I now have new images in my head of how this all works, right? I'm, I'm always trying to map, you saw our images of the maps. I'm always trying to map this, and now you've just added a whole other layer of complication, um, <laughs> which I'm now excited about. Um, so I think across all of your introductions, I really, A, appreciate the work that you're doing in linking research and practice. Um, and I appreciate you sharing some of the strategies that um, that you use. And I actually think that across all of you, we have some nice illustrations of some of the examples I provided on that last slide around amplifying work, bringing people together in, to interact, um, technical assistance, um, advocacy work, right? And then also the sharing, pushing in the backward direction, right? David shared in the um, chat a document about the research agenda conference report um, from NCTM where they really advocated for linking research and practice and driving a research agenda around uh, problems of practice. Uh, so I'd love to hear um, a little bit about how, um, if maybe share an example of working with researchers or with research and in doing that sort of help us understand um, what the sort of benefits or challenges of working with researchers might be um, because one of the things we know and, and some of you described uh, that there are some um, some challenges in doing that work right data mentioned um, challenges with putting them in a room together and getting them to end those sessions, right? Like Yuki said, he's got to get up there and say, okay, make sure that the ideas that are coming out through Edutopia and the foundation, right, are actually aligned to research. And, and, you know, Matt talked about different ways that sort of engages with researchers around their research. But I'm thinking about, you know, examples of work where your organization benefited, the research researcher benefited, and the, you know, the practice side benefited. I wonder if some illustrative examples, and you don't, if, if you don't have one off the top of your head, that's completely fine. But I think some of those stories help bring those activities to life. Does anyone have what they could share? Yeah, Elizabeth, I, I don't mind jumping in on this one. Great. Um, so I, I want to talk about one specific research and practice partnership I, I have benefited uh, in being a part of. My state has benefited and really all 50 states and territories. It's an interesting research and practice partnership. I mentioned earlier um, before my, my current position, I served as the Director of Science and Engineering Education at the State Department of Education. I also served in that capacity as the president of an organization known as the Council of State Science Supervisors. This is an organization that represents all uh, 50 states and territories, the individuals that uh, serve as the specialist or directors for science education in their state at state departments of education. It's pretty unique and I must admit a really great group of people uh, to be connected with. And uh, prior to my, my um, term as president in that organization, we had already begun as an organization to think about how we could be more connected to researchers in the science education field. And we started, uh, we started by first inviting them to be a part of our yearly or annual conference. And then we had subcommittee working groups where we thought it might benefit for each subcommittee to have a researcher be a part of um, the leadership structure on those subcommittees. And that led to other opportunities, including 
um, uh, an opportunity to apply for an NSF grant uh, with a couple of the researchers that were on our committees. And that grant uh, was uh, work, or the, the name of the project is Ad Access, um, Advancing Coherent and Equitable Systems of Science Education. So I had an opportunity to serve as the co-PI on that grant for seven years. And what we really were able to do with that grant, with all 50 states and territories, is work with the, the researchers and their graduate students to identify what are the biggest needs we have as states and territories with implementing the vision of um, the vision for science education that was published in the framework for K through 12 science education. How can we assure that uh, there are equitable opportunities for students to participate in learning experiences that meet that vision. And so in that partnership, what we really were able to do in working with our researchers was to think about what are the resources that we need in our states and can we work together to co-design those. In addition to that, we knew as state leaders, we didn't have access to the kind of data that would allow us to know how far we were progressing with uh, school districts implementing that vision. So we worked with them also to, to design ways to collect data within our states um, and, and analyze that data. And it really added to our capacity as state leaders. Um, we may not have had a background in analyzing uh, data. We had not been introduced to things like practical measures. Um, perhaps many of us had never facilitated a proper focus group. Uh, and a variety of other ways that we learned how to collect data. But the researchers also analyzed some of our data for us or with us to add to that capacity. I'll put a link in the chat um, to uh, all of the resources um, and, and the work that's been developed out of that grant, but it has led to a long-standing partnership with state science supervisors at state departments of education. I've talked about the benefits of that particular research and practice partnership. I also want to just address challenges. It's been a great partnership, but there are also things that I think are just uh, important to keep in mind with intermediary organizations. Sometimes our researchers wanted to push on the gas a little more than we could at the state level in certain areas of focus. And those were really you know, points of negotiation for us. Um, because at state level, or even at the district level, you deal with politics that perhaps researchers don't uh, deal with in their day to day. So we really had to um, work slow together to move forward in the work that we were doing. And I would say what made this a very successful research and practice partnership is our researchers were intent on looking at what are the real needs that we had as practitioners, as opposed to, uh, here's what I'm doing, let's figure out how what you need fits in with this. It was really the opposite. It started with our needs. It continued to look um, at, as landscapes shifted, what were new needs that we needed to address. And so uh, again, that, that's an example I would give uh, Elizabeth and that partnership is ongoing. Um, we now have pathways for researchers to be uh, members of our state or, or the national organization. Um, and, and we find ways to really connect them to the work that um, we are doing or need to have done. And it's a very um, you know, mutually beneficial relationship. Great example. And I, I am aware of that, that partnership and, and it's been shared a little bit with the research community through um, some different uh, venues. So thank you so much for sharing more detail about how that came to be and some of the challenges of that work. Does anyone else have an anecdote that they'd like to share? You're going to have to be bold enough to be good. <laughs> Thank you. No, I was just going to share. I mean, I mean, so we, like I said, we we are starting that process, and so the the partnership that we have with um, Northwestern right now, there's probably this Gates thing, but part, part of that is creating kind of a, a way to easy, more easily share our data um, with researchers, or, you know who are interested in, in these kind of things. I mean, obviously there's a vetting process and all that good stuff. It's, it's very similar to something like the um, restricted access data for NCES, but it's just, you know, again, the goal is to, to provide data in a, in a different way. Um, again, it's not tied to particular products or whatever the case is, but to kind of hopefully, you know, help supplement other data that's already out there. I will say, I mean, I, I think the idea of the research practitioner partnership stuff is, is really great. And again, like it was just in a meeting 
in, in Kate's about this, but also in my previous life, I was a director of the Realm Midwest. And so when we were doing this back in the 2000s or whatever, when it kind of, you know, we, this was one of the, the first times we kind of did that, at least in the REL program. I think that what Tiffany said about the alignment and about this idea of like, you know, is it, is it really a partnership? And sometimes I think researchers can, there's a difference between recruiting for a study and being part of a partnership. And sometimes researchers kind of, the partnership becomes a recruitment for, I have an RCT that I'm trying to do and I just need people to participate. And yeah, they're kind of interested in that, but that's not the same thing as, as a partnership. And, and I think that just being at this, this meeting, I was at, you know, with the Gates Foundation, again, it's another, it's a research partnership thing, but the idea of centering your partner and centering, understanding what their needs are and understanding what the practitioners are actually doing, there may not be a great line between what the researcher really wants to do and what the what the partner needs and, and being open about that and kind of clear on what you're trying to do is really, really critical. I think at the end of the day, I think we all want to share data and we're all happy to have these conversations, but there is a practical point to all this and people have, you know, a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of, a lot of different competing um, needs. And so it's not a question of, do we have the data? A lot of the times it's like, well, how is this going to help us push forward what we want? And again, it's different for, for organizations like curriculum associates as opposed to like the state or, you know, NCTM or whatever, but we all have different needs. And again, I, I, I do think it's incumbent upon the researcher who's, who's approaching folks to have that information available and to be able to answer the question, well, what, in essence, like, what do I get out of it? Right. Like what, what do I, as a partner, what am I going to, what am I going to get? Because sometimes that's lost in the conversation and, you know, for the researcher to be able to easily articulate what that benefit is, is really, really important and really critical. It just makes it easier for, for us to decide, you know, where, where do we want to, you know, we have limited resources too. So where do we want to put those resources and what kinds of things would we, you know, be willing to support? This, um, I can I just jump in here for a second and, and just want to say, Matt, I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, I think as a profession, teachers and educators are often the most generous people with their time and they really want to contribute um, to the research community and, and participate actively in studies and focus groups. However, the feedback loop is often lopsided and they don't get the feedback, they don't get the impact, they, the impact studies, and they often don't know how much they've contributed to a body of research and if there's a way that we can streamline and make that um, information more accessible and readily available once it becomes available to those who have participated, I think that engagement is more likely to become um, more um, active if we can figure out how to do that. I'll jump in here too a bit. I mean, from the council side, we win if there are more partnerships. If there, if there are more places where researchers and practitioners come together to figure out something and then to share that out that's better for us but i'm gonna go back to sort of matt's piece you know like what do the groups value mm -hmm. what is the decision making structure what is the leadership piece and how do we make sure that um that there's helping to build ways or structures so there's equal footing or at least positive ways to start. Maybe it doesn't end up, but how do we help them find a way to come together at the beginning to start to think about what this is with, with I think, the right perspective? Because there are widely different pressures and expectations on the two groups that are there, and that needs to sort of be negotiated about what can we do, what are the things, what are the contributions, and and how does that fit together to say, yes, we're in this together? Such good points. Yuki, go ahead, sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll hop in. So there's, a, there's an aspect of my job that I really love. So most of my day-to-day -day work is, you know, reading journals, reading studies, really very grounded kind of just raw work where I'm talking to researchers. Um, I'm doing a lot of very detail-oriented work. But what I love is when I take a step back 
and I look at the kind of the national conversation. Like, how does the, the, the field of education need to be updated to align to what researchers are telling us? And let me give you an example. So a few years ago, um, we published a, a 33 video series called How Learning Happens. And this was based off of the science of learning and development uh, from Linda Darling, Hammond, Pam, Linda Darling Hammond, Pam Cantor, and Karen Pittman, um, who worked on a whole series of studies looking at um, how we need to update our understanding of how students learn, looking not just things, not just looking at interventions that work, but looking at kind of the, the, the latest insights uh, into how students learn, like the, the importance of relationships, what trauma-informed uh, education is, looking at how uh, executive functioning skills work or, or uh, the cognition of learning, looking at how working memory works, uh, cognitive load, just this, the whole gamut of just these ideas that are evidence-based and very scientific that uh, would give teachers and educators uh, a better insight, a better understanding of how students learn. That way you're not so much just focused on the specific interventions, but also creating the conditions for how students learn. So one of my favorite parts, so we, we spoke to them, we spoke to ex experts and we took what they, we took the research and we went to schools, we went to a handful of schools and kind of filmed uh, examples, like classroom examples of things like notices and wonders, what teachers are doing to kind of highlight information um, that isn't just direct instruction, but also creating um, activities that help students really retain the information more and gain a deeper understanding. So what I, what I, um, so my, my kind of perspective is a little bit different because I tend to think of things like the science of reading and how uh, when Edgetopia produces content, we not only have to think about what the studies are, what the research are, what the research is, but what the national conversation is, what the, what the debate is and how we can find a middle ground that teachers can exist in where we're looking at you know, what works for students and how the research can inform uh, not only classroom practices, but also programs, school-wide uh, implementation and districts. So I'm struck by um, a, a couple of things. Um, one is the idea of value that the work of collaborating with researchers needs um, need a value for your organization, right? Or simultaneously, the work that researchers bring to the table, depending on the kind of activity you're engaged, needs to have value for the practice community. And the value that working with educators um, things needs to be elevated. So I think this idea of value is really important for us as the research community to think about. What is, what is the value of the collaboration? What is the value of the work that we're doing? And how can we sort of make that value clearer? Now I'll say, um, in my own experience, and, and also I think for many of the researchers that are on this call or, or will be viewing this, um, we have an idea about the value of our work because we all come to it wanting to, to, to make a difference, right? To do right by students and communities. We're sort of all of that mindset, but we come from a different universe. We work in a different universe. And so we're not always clear about, about what exactly the value is, right? We, we think, we know it, there's a there there, right? We're, we're convinced of that, right? So. How, how should we be thinking about that? Or are there ways to work with your organizations to sort of um, articulate that value or, or amplify that value? Um, you know, I'm thinking, um, David mentioned value, Lisa mentioned all these different ways sort of getting research out there. We've invited these panelists, right? So you've identified, um, speakers or authors, um, you know, or Yuki and Yuki's work, right? Identifying researchers whose work has value. How, how, do, how should we be thinking about communicating that value to you or to the broader public so that we can, so that, you, that we can start relationships or we can start this work together? Is sort of tips or strategies that you might have for, 
researchers? I think I think Elizabeth, it's it's two pronged. So one, I think researchers have to embed themselves in um, practitioners' worlds, whatever that looks like. If you have a school, a partnership with a school district, if you are connected with one of the organizations um, that um, might um, have uh, work that's connected to practitioners that is connected to the research you're interested in. And it has to be authentic connections, right? I, I believe practitioners, uh, I know I at the state level, I know the difference between a researcher who contacts or reaches out who really believes in research and practice partnerships versus a researcher who's looking to get something out of us at the state level without um, the intent of, of trying to do what is mutually beneficial or, you know, understanding our needs. And, and that takes time. Like if I get a cold call of someone who's wanting to do something, I'm less likely to move forward on that than if I have an established relationship with, with someone. So it, it is that authentic, you know, connection. And I think for researchers, uh, however you divide your time up and, and I know it's very valuable and, and hard to carve out time for everything. But as valuable as your research communities are, I think practitioner communities are, are equally as valuable. And that addresses the perhaps the how to, uh, you know, make those connections. As far as the dissemination, I have just always felt that practical packaging of research is so very important. So I'll put a link in the chat to um, three different styles of packaging research um, that I think have been widely uptaken uh, in the practitioner, practitioner world, uh, but it is coupled with, and um, uh, I believe, um, I, I don't remember who said this earlier, but it's coupled with this idea of here's the research, but now what do you do with the research that is practical? And what are the resources that have been developed related to this research to help you along in um, implementing this or using the research effectively. And I think that practical use comes from, again, working closely with practitioners in relationship to co-design things or to get feedback on things. Um, but, but authentic relationships and practical packaging of the research, to me, those are, are key. And I would, I would kind of add that I think that the two main things I think are important is come with a clear research question. So like, what are you, what, what are you trying to study? Um, you know, cause I, sometimes it's, it's harder to have conversations when people are not exactly sure. And, and kind of a corollary to that is do your homework. And so again, like, why are you talking to me? Happy to help. But, you know, again, if, if I have to explain all the different ins and outs and all that, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, and I think, you know, again, like just that clarity of purpose and being able to kind of say it just, it just makes it a lot easier and more streamlined. And, and I, I agree, I think we've all kind of said like the, the, the relationship part is huge. And again, like I may not have, I may not be the person to answer your question, but I can probably get you to somebody who will, right? And I think in, in, I think in even your own research, it kind of showed that a lot of it is in education just in general, it's about research. It's about, sorry, it's about relationships. Who do I know? Who can I talk to? Who can I you know, hook into that can you know, maybe answer your question? And I think that, again, like I think we're all willing to kind of share that information, but it's also the same kind of thing. If I'm going to reach out to somebody I know, I need to know that, you know, you know what you're talking about and, you know, you, you have a, a, a research question. So the reason that they're going to use my name to talk to you is because, you know, I've, I've kind of, you know, directed them and, and there's a, there's a clear purpose there. So again, I mean, I, I do think it's incumbent upon the researcher to have some of that stuff laid out to begin with, you know, when they have these conversations. And so it's easier to understand, because again, sometimes we don't know who you are either. And so when there's a cold call, especially, you know, we, we have the same questions. Well, what's your research question? Okay, well, great. What data are you going to do? Great. How are you going to handle this? Or how are you going to do this? Or, you know, what, what kind of schools are you looking for? What kind of districts are you looking for? What kinds of students? You know what I mean? Like some of those basic questions. And the more that you have that stuff kind of already laid out, you know, the easier it is to, to give you the information that you need. Whether or not we can provide that data is a separate, sometimes it's a separate issue, but at least to kind of help, you know, point you in the right direction or get you on the right track. And I would just follow up by saying, um, I had the minute Tiffany said authentic, I had authenticity, clarity. What are you seeking to solve, and um, how are you? How will educators and students benefit 
by your research. I mean, I think from our perspective, this notion of value, are all values being um, supported and in what ways and how will your research inform and shape those values of those that you're seeking to pro provide solutions for? So building on those ideas, you know, and I, as I think about sort of the discussions we've had and that work, um, researchers approaching sort of practitioner groups, I mean, I think there are two possible or potentially possible ways you could do it. One is like, what do you do well? Like, in, and how, can we really better understand the things that you're doing well at this school or in these areas? How do we build on those things? And sort of what are then the challenges that we wanna work on? It's not gonna say we're gonna come up with an answer, but how do we better understand the challenges you have and research those pieces to build and try and utilize different um, things to address those challenges? You know, through this discussion too, I think it's value there's also risk. And I think that is also unequal in these sort of dynamics, that the practitioners are oftentimes taking on more of the risk. Like if this, does, like they're sort of front and center when these things come out or this doesn't work or these things, they're, they're owning a lot of that, um, that work. And, and shouldering those things where the researchers, I think are sort of more in the background. And so also understanding how that works and making sure you're positioned on being in that together um, is, one of the, is one of the concerns that I would think about coming into it. So go, go ahead, oh, just, just Just really quickly, whenever, Whenever I talk to a researcher, I always, there's kind of, here's a little kind of like a, a thought exercise. Um, imagine you're a researcher. So, so I was a researcher and we we're, we're very detail oriented. We built from the ground up, you know, when we develop a study, we're, we're concerned with the details. This is an RCT, we're, we're looking at the model, you know, um, we're, we're making sure that the actual study um, is designed well, but uh, a little kind of exercise is to imagine that you have kids and you're talking to your kid's teacher about your research. And I think when, when you do that, you kind of put yourself into the mindset of a lot of the things that David has mentioned, like there's a lot of risk for teachers. Whenever I write an article or, 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 or a video or anything I just your producers, we're always thinking about, okay, if a teacher were to do that, not only are, are we thinking about whether or not the strategy works. I'm obviously we want the strategy to work. We're also thinking about what are the risks involved. Like, for example, sometimes we get pitches where a teacher is asking students to reenact a historical time period. That might not necessarily be appropriate. So we're always thinking, okay, maybe this might work in a particular context. But this, if we're talking about thousands of educators trying to do this, there's a lot of potential for risk. There's a lot of potential for, for a strategy to backfire. Um, so that's always front and center for us. Not necessarily whether a strategy works, but we're always thinking about the margins. Uh, for, for, for example, um, researchers, we like to create very controlled conditions. You know, we have, we try to create a very clean control group uh, and, a treat, uh, and a control group and an experimental group. We try to make sure that, you know, we, reduce as much noise as possible, or at the very least, we, we try to mitigate for that. And we try to create conditions where we can generalize the, the findings of the study so that teachers can take a look at the average and know that this is an effective intervention. But a teacher in the classroom isn't necessarily thinking about the average, isn't necessarily thinking, oh, can I get my students, can I get my students' test scores up? Or can I get my students to learn a little bit more? The teacher won't a teacher won't trade, you know, a student going from let's say a B to an A if that means that the student who is really struggling is going to do worse. So, a lot of times I think about who are the most vulnerable students and what are the impacts for an intervention for those students, and that to me 
is often much more important than the average um, benefits of an intervention. Elizabeth, can I just follow up on one thing that um, Yogi just mentioned that, that made me remember uh, something. In one of the practitioner partnerships that I have been a part of, I remember uh, a colleague of mine who was also um, a practitioner in that setting. Our first probably six months of meetings, we had a back channel where we were trying to um, identify terms that we didn't understand that were being shared and trying to look up definitions for those terms. So I, I, I mentioned that because oftentimes I find that experts in the field and research, um, they, they understand deeply terminology that perhaps practitioners wouldn't know. And it, it almost can, can certainly make us feel left out of the conversations or not an equal partner in that. So I would just encourage those that are that are working in partnership with practitioners to keep that in mind. Um, and also, I have noticed that terminology and research, what is um, common terminology today, next month, there are three new terms that are further breaking that last term down. And just keep in mind that that is as challenging to keep up with as I'm sure the acronyms in uh, K through 12 settings are for many people not in K through 12. So uh, I, I do sometimes determine in a partnership if, if too much uh, terminology without really ensuring that everyone understands it um, is thrown around if that's the right partnership to be a part of. I would be, Liz, may I jump in one more time? I would be remiss in my role um, as representative of AFT if it, I did not address this issue of um, value and, and to Tiffany's point around terminology, around the politicalization of values and terminology, especially in this current climate. And so um, there are entities in, um, yeah, entities and agents and agencies that are employing research to justify actions and legislation that are being turned into policies that impact um, educators in classrooms currently. And so I think as we move forward in the next iteration of education in this country, as researchers are being asked to um, think about how they frame research and research questions, that should start to become a part of their thought processes about how they will engage in research and engage with practitioners in, in ways that may look different than what they've done in the past. And I think that's as safe as I want to be in trying to frame that without it being overtly political, but I think that that is something we need to start having a conversation about. I really appreciate that point. I, re I really appreciate all the points, but that is a particularly salient point, right? For all of our collective work, the research work, the practice work and the intermediary work um, that, that you all are doing it and how we talk about, how we frame, how we, um, you know, participate in, in this, in the current climate um, requires thought, care, um, and intentionality. So I, I appreciate that. So one of the things that um, I, I want to make sure that we do is, you know, get a little brass tacks here, right? So what we did in our very first session um, in this webinar series was we created a board where folks were asked to respond to um, a, a prompt, a question about uh, systematically engaging with intermediaries and other brokers. I'm going to drop Jamboard into the chat here. I'm not going to pull it up, um, but folks put some ideas and suggestions in there. And I'm going to be direct and say they're kind of all over the map. And so I asked the panelists to have a look at some of these in advance. And, and maybe comment or reflect on them. Before I ask them to do that, I'm gonna sort of recap what I heard and ask the audience, feel free to post to this Jamboard or response, add my idea, add any suggestion, we heard a lot. Um, so just real quickly, um, I wanna think about action. What, what specifically researchers can do? 
Um, and, and specifically in working with you. So one of the things that I heard is they need to build relationships with your organizations and they need to build relationships broadly, right? So that includes with practitioners, but that also includes with you, right? So their, their groups can come from working in partnership with the intermediate organizations, but it's it's got to come from an authentic relationship and an authentic shared need or goal, not sort of a cold call with ill-defined purposes and values. Um, another thing I heard is that researchers really need to be clear about the their goal, the contribution they think they can make, um, and be prepared to have conversations about that with folks like yourself. So clarity and preparedness. Um, to, to go into a, a relationship, to build a relationship. Um, and then there's this idea of, of packaging, right? Like, how do we communicate this? Now, I wonder, I'll say as a researcher, um, we're not particularly good at, at this, but some of your organizations particularly are, right? <laughs> um, and, and thinking about, okay, how do we help these research um, based ideas become part of um, a, a, a tool, right? A resource webinar, right? Like how, how do we think about that? Um, so I think there's some packaging, like activities around packaging and committing those ideas that researchers need to work on. But I also think that's one of the strengths that the intermediary community has, um, not like organizations serve different functions. So that will look different for different ones of you. Um, but that's another sort of action. So recapping some of that um, and thinking about some of the ideas on the Jamboard, does anyone want to talk um, or share a sort of reaction to these action steps or ideas that, that we're coming up with here or add one or say, oh, no, 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 that's a bad idea. Don't, don't, don't do that one. Or does anything strike you as um, a particularly good idea. And I also encourage the audience to use the, the chat as well. And I'm not gonna call on anyone, so someone's gonna have to jump in. Well, it may not be a surprise, but I, uh, whomever put the sticky note about um, systematized protocols for dissemination formats, for different types of evidence. I think if that were something that came about that was readily available to researchers for how to practice or how to package um, uh, their research in, in a way where it speaks more broadly to maybe to non-researchers, mm -hmm. I could see that being very beneficial because if those in the field are able to access um, uh, some of the end forms of those templates, then the burden of trying to understand the structure or where to find things or how to think about things um, is, is not an added um, burden for them. They can just simply dig, in, dig into the research. I think one thing that jumps out at me is this idea of brokers. And I, I think that in, in, in on this group here, there's, there's kind of different we're all kind of coming from different spaces, I guess, in terms of what, what we can do. Um, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, a lot of researchers are just looking for data, right? They're looking for data for their specific thing. And so that that's a particular kind of request. In other places, they're looking for, again, relationships, or can you connect me to so-and-so, um, or, you know, or even like, hey, can I pick your brain? You guys have done this kind of research before. You know, how can we, you know, I'm looking to do some of the project, you know, kind of help me do that. So I think, again, like thinking about you, what your needs are and kind of when you're talking about, you know, talking to a broker, I don't like that term for some reason, um, or an intermediary, like what, what is it that, you, again, like what, why are you asking it and how are they going to help you get what it is you need? Because if you just need data, that's one thing, right? And so there's lots of different ways to potentially do that. Um, I know for us, a lot of the folks that, that um, <laughs> a lot of the folks that, that come to us are more 
like again, they're they're in grad, like they, they work at the district, they're in graduate school. And so, and, the, and again, it's something we have not talked about is the, the the legal side of all this and the data agreements and the different things that you know are are we're all bound by in terms of we want to share data. It's not our data, it's the district's data, it's, it's actually the students' data. And so, you know, there's those kinds of practical concerns um, that are part of it. And so again, like if you're looking for data, that's one thing. If you're looking for to start or be part of a larger kind of research practitioner partnership, yeah, we can certainly help that. And when we do that in terms of like, you know, we can get you connected to the folks that we talk to at districts and you can certainly contact them and see if they're interested in participating. So there's that kind of version of it. Um, so anyway, just just kind of, I, th I think, you know, that, that larger sense of, you know, again, matching up what the broker is doing and what they can do and what you kind of need or what you're looking for. Can I piggyback real quick before folks jump in? So I think one of the challenges we face is that, um, you know, so I showed that data earlier, right, where educators for research-based information. Well, we asked researchers that same question and it's like that, right? So I think that folks don't, know how to identify folks like yourselves. They don't know how to identify the people who are, are best situated to, to help them or would be good partners, right? There's sort of this discovery that needs to happen to you. Is there any, do you have any guidance on how people might find? I mean, I, I think, again, I think in some ways for, again, <laughs> I think the original reason I came here because I reacted to something somebody said on a, on a previous one about like who's got the biggest megaphone or like over you know some these, these for profit companies are doing X Y and Z. I mean, I, I think sometimes people have to kind of get over the like there's some sort of if it's a for profit versus a non profit and all that kind of stuff. We go to conferences. We're at AARA. We're at NCME. We're at SREE. We're at state conferences. We have our own conferences. I mean, we put stuff out on that's got you know who, who wrote it. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of things that are out there that, you know, again, just like anything else, you can, if you go to a conference, I mean, cause I, I would, I do it too. And something was interesting. I'd go and talk to the researcher afterwards and they'd give you a card. And that's kind of how, you know, just the old, old fashioned way, I guess, for a better term. But I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think that there's, and again, I get the notion that, oh, well, they're just promoting their own stuff in, in some cases. Yes. But at the same time, I mean, just speaking for me, I mean, like we need to get our research into what was clearing house. We need to get our research into evidence for us. So we're under the exact same rules as everybody else is. And when we go to a conference, we have to submit our stuff to, a, we have to submit our proposals to a conference and we go through the exact same process as everybody else. So there's not like some sort of inherent advantage. I mean, obviously we have, we're in a lot of districts we have a lot of partnerships and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and we have big, you know, we have advisory committees and we have technical advisory committees and we have big names on those, those folks. So yes, we have, we have reach, but at the same time, we have to go through the same, you know, we jump to the same hoops as everybody else. And again, I think that there are plenty of opportunities and they're all, they're, they're public. And again, we're just one. I mean, you can, NWA does the same thing or Renaissance does the same thing, or, you know, a lot of the, the publishing companies are at all these different conferences and they're all out there. And they, again, I think they would all say the same thing. Yeah. We love people coming to us and asking us and um, you know, and if we can help, we're going to, we're going to try it out. Cause again, students do better. We do better. Right. I mean, that's, that's, that's the end of the day. Like, and, and we want to do things that help students do better. So I think and that's, that's why we all kind of do this. So look at my soapbox. <laughs> no. Liz, I think um, to your point, most people are often surprised to know that both NEA and AFT actually has an entire PD arm. And, you know, in some regards, I actually like not being known as the person that's managing our PD side, because then I become this one-stop shop gatekeeper of all things PD, um, which is good and bad. But I mean, to your point in looking at the Jamboard and um, to Tiffany's point, Yes, systematizing protocols for dissemination is actually helpful. And if we can figure that part out, um, you know, I think we all can retire or semi-retire anyway. But I think the other piece though is when I was looking at this jam board, I was thinking about the creating a professional space to share best practices in data literacy. I mean, that's a huge piece um, in of itself. And thinking about how, again, educators and school personnel are still struggling with data literacy in of itself. If, 
the pandemic showed us nothing else, that that's still a huge um, skills gap that we're still wrestling with. I think we did incredibly well under the circumstances, but on the receiving end for school staff who are still wrestling with the mounds of data, is it relevant data? Is it the data that we need? And where is this data going? And how is it going to inform my practice? Will it improve student outcomes? And all the questions associated with that. Um, it's almost like educators, when they're dealing with researchers, should school educators have a bill of rights around data, you know, data and working with researchers. What are my rights as an educator when I'm engaged with the researcher in the research community? And how, you know, what, how am I accountable to the district? And, you know, there are just so many questions that I feel like educators, especially those new to the profession, when they enter into these collaborations with researchers, that they may need a little more handholding um, when engaging with researchers. So something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, David. Action steps. What's that? <laughs> Action items for, for researchers. What do we need to do? So I'm going to push the research community because I feel like I'm going to go back to the value piece. What they value is publishing in research journals and talking at research conferences. And I will say that's not enough. And you have the research community people moving up into leadership positions at universities and that we need to talk, we need to think more broadly about impact. You know, an impact oftentimes is quantified by who references mine and what journals am I in. We need to think about the reach and where that goes. And I will just tell you our experiences. There are researchers that do great research articles, but when we ask them to publish something more for our practitioners or do these types of things, it's not valued by their institutions professionally. They understand that there's a need, but we don't do that. And so I think it is sort of an internal push to say, yes, as research institutions, we value linking research and practice. And that comes in multiple, multiple ways. It is both partnering with, but it's also communicating with and building these pieces out. So um, it, you know, I, I think that we come together, we need to work and make this more valuable. We all need to elevate this linking research and practice partnerships across the work that we do. It's not, it doesn't fall just to one group. I love that. I love that. Because I agree. All right. Yee. So, so I interview a lot of researchers and Whenever I'm conducting an interview, there, there are kind of two broad phases. So the first phase is when I'm talking to a researcher. And that's when we're talking about the study or studies, we're talking about the research, and we're really getting into the details. Um, and that's uh, important, but my favorite phase comes kind of closer to the second half. And that's when I'm talking to an expert. That's when I'm talking to someone who's comfortable enough to kind of go beyond the parameters of the study of the research and start talking about insights start talking about not like what is effective, but why is it effective? And let me give you an example. So I remember I was talking to a researcher about the benefits of drawing on learning. So we go over the study, we talk about the study, we talk about effect sizes, we talk about uh, the fact that drawing a concept can be more um, effective than simply uh, looking at a picture or listening to it. And so that's, that's pretty straightforward. But when the conversation gets really interest, interesting is when I'm able to really dig into why it is effective, what are the insights, what's happening cognitively that makes this an effective strategy? Why is it that elaborating on a concept, not just, not just trying to memorize it, but actually trying to reconstruct a concept, why is that beneficial for learning? What, does, what impact does that have for teachers and students? So that's that's when my that's when the conversations get really interesting, and that's when I know I have a really solid article that I can write because I'm not just telling teachers go do this, but I'm trying to give them kind of that light bulb moment, that aha moment where they where they have that kind of deeper understanding of how students learn, and they're not just blindly giving our projects to students, but now they're kind of aligning the strategy to the research. They're saying, you know, we need to have a learning goal. We need to 
enact these mechanisms, these cognitive mechanisms that encourage students to, uh, to practice what they're learning, retrieval practice, to reinforce it, to, to not just learn it once and forget, but to do it multiple times over the school year. And, and that's when I think you have a, a better informed educator, when they don't just have a tool belt, two belt of strategies that they can use when necessary, but they have a deeper understanding of how students learn. So to me, and I know that's hard. I was a researcher. It's really hard to go out of, you know, especially if you're an early career researcher, you want to stick to your study. You want to stick to the parameters of your study. But also, oftentimes researchers don't exist alone. You know, oftentimes you're part of a university group and you can leverage that. And you can say, you know, even though I'm, I'm you know, a postdoc, um, it, it's helpful to, to be able to like say, you know, like, at our at our group or our university, our research group, you know, we have these insights that we think are really important for teachers to learn and then build off of that because it's very hard. Studies are very hard for teachers to read first because, you know, they're inaccessible um, and they often cost a lot, but also there's so much jargon. There's so much technical detail. You really want kind of like what's the big takeaway? Like if I'm only going to spend one minute describing the study to you, like, what is the major thing that I want you to uh, take away from the study? Is it that um, a particular strategy is effective? Yes, but it's also, how does this kind of illuminate how students think and learn? Um, how does this illuminate uh, your teaching practices or the conditions of learning at your school? Um, so it's, and one way to do that is to really look at other research, which everyone does, you know, we all do that, but to look at, um, kind of the field of research. Go go to like Edweek and Heckinger, go to NPR and, and really get a good understanding of the field. That way you start looking at the conversations and you start understanding the conversations and the nuances of the conversations. Um, so I'll stop there. Thank you. No, I I I know all of your comments. I appreciate the the truly valuable and actionable insights that you're sharing because I think folks on the call are really, I mean, people are on attending this series because they want to to take seriously the suggestions and strategies that they're hearing from you and from um, in our prior session. And I'm just reminded how you know fabulous it was to close this series with you here um, because you are sharing insights that really span boundaries, right? You share insights from working with researchers, from being researchers. You share insights from working with practitioners, from being practitioners, from sitting in this intermediary space. And I think you've really hit home on a lot of the themes and ideas that have come up across multiple multiple sessions and conversations that we've had as a center and in collaboration with SRI. So I'm extremely appreciative for your contributions and your ideas. Um, we have two minutes left. I'm afraid that's probably not going to be enough to have like an open dialogue. But for folks that are on the call, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. Um, if our panelists can't answer them right now, I'm sure that we can communicate with them if you get some burning, you know, questions out there and get some answers for you. Um, I really appreciate your time. I do want to share that you can check out all of the webinars on this link that I'm going to drop into the chat. I'm also going to shamelessly promote that um, some of the ideas that came up in this conversation are really closely related to what we're doing next at the Center for Research, Use, and Education. We're launching a new initiative called CREATED, this um, collaboration, <laughs> collaboration, research, equity, action, together for education. It's terrible verbally. It looks very lovely in print. Um, <clears throat> but the idea is that we want to um, we're focusing on, on collaborative design and, and brokering, right? So it actually help, right, to Yuki's point, to share, right, like, how do you get to the idea? How do you articulate, like, what this means and why it would be important so that a, a teacher or educator or policymaker knows what they're doing and why they're doing it, right? And to the packaging piece that I know Tiffany had to drop off, um, to the packaging piece, right? To the communicating the values piece, right? To thinking about all those. So we're really excited about that next step. Please stay tuned for um, our web, which is researchforschools.org for more reports and information. Um, and if you, we can ever be, you know, of use to anyone on this call or, uh, you know, we look forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Yuki. Thank you, David. Um, and thank you to Sri and Ellen and Jen for getting this going.